Okay, good evening, everybody. You're very welcome uh, to this Engineers Ireland evening talk. Uh, my name is Barry McMullen. I'm the chair of the Energy, Environment, Climate Action Division at Engineers Ireland. Uh, and it's my pleasure uh, to introduce this, the latest in our series of evening talks um, uh, on power flow analysis in a decarbonized European grid, a 2050 perspective. But just before I introduce our speakers for this evening, I just want to mention uh, this other upcoming event uh, for the division, which is a continuous professional development seminar, which will be on the 5th of April, uh, just five weeks away, I think, from today, uh, on deep decarbonization in the non-residential building and industry sectors. This doesn't tend to get as much attention, perhaps, as it should um, but certainly from an engineering perspective, it's very important. So we have an excellent slate of speakers already lined up. Uh, we have some other speakers still to be confirmed, but do please uh, get in touch with us uh, if you would like to register for that event. Uh, that would be great. Uh, I'm, I'm going to hand you over now. We, we have two distinguished speakers with us this evening. Andrew Keane is a professor in the School of uh, electrical and Electronic Engineering at UCD and Director of the Ener Energy Institute at UCD. He leads a, a group focused on power system planning and operation, uh, especially distribution networks. Um, and uh, this particular project done in conjunction with Supernode uh, is a very important and very intriguing one that I'm certainly looking forward to hearing more about myself. Marcus Byrne is Market Policy Analyst at Supernode. He has a degree in Master's in Mechanical Engineering from University College Dublin. University College Dublin is awfully well represented. I, I have to confess that my own de degree, in fact, degrees are, are all from UCD as well. So, you know, UCD is great, but there are other universities as well. But I, I, I'll not go through, through this this evening. Anyway, look, uh, uh, a very big welcome to Marcus and Andrew. Uh, we'll let you go through your presentations. Uh, questions, please uh, log them in the Q&A area in the webinar format if you can. Um, and then we'll come back. To, we'll, we'll line those up and take them all together at the end. So I think it's Andrew up first. So I'll hand over to you, Andrew. Thanks. Thanks very much for the warm introduction, Barry. And nice to, to be here and welcome to everyone online. Um, so myself and Marcus from Supernote this evening are going to present the results of a study we did, gosh, was it two years ago almost now, Marcus, hard to believe, yeah, during, during COVID times at least, uh, we're just looking at kind of future scenarios for the European grid, for in particularly 2050, what would a decarbonized grid look like, and looking really at the structural nature of the flows and what the makeup might be or what it could be or indeed what, what it should be. Um, to set the scene a little bit, um, I'll, I'll turn to a slide I've, I've used before, so apologies <laughs> if this is not the first time you're, you're stuck listening to me, right? But to point to kind of where the context for decarbonization is, and I think this document from the European Union is particularly relevant, um, powering a climate neutral economy and EU strategy for energy system integration. The first presented, I saw it last year when Professor Ronnie Bellman from KU Leuven came to, to, to UCD to Dublin to present. Um, but there's three, I think, important principles here that I think are kind of be a guiding hand for where we should go and are going. So first, a more circular energy system with energy efficiency at its core. Um, so absolutely, we need to kind of, you know, consume less and where we are consuming, make it circular, make it as efficient as possible. Second, and really significantly, I think for the work we present tonight and in general is a greater direct electrification of end use sectors. So again, the efficiency gains of principle one can also be captured through principle two. So electrification, as we know well, I'm sure in the room and online here, is a key pillar of our decarbonization strategy. And um, the parallel or simultaneous integration of renewable energy and electrification of, of as much as possible. Thirdly, and not to be ignored, um, is of course where sectors where electrification is difficult and will be impossible, in fact, let's say. Uh, the strategy promotes clean fuels, including green hydrogen, sustainable biofuels and biogas, what perhaps be summed up as, as molecules. Um, but the key piece here is that, you know, there's kind of a priority list here, efficient as possible, circular, then electrification, and then finally, where we can't electrify, really use clean fuels such as renewable hydrogen, and we will certainly need green hydrogen in the future. Um, the laws of thermodynamics, physics, et cetera, really are kind of underpinning and behind these principles as outlined in, in a policy document. I like it because it's kind of a policy document that actually has thermodynamics and, and good engineering at, at its core. So moving on then just down to the, the scope of this study, 
on the basis of the first slide, on the basis of everything we know around the climate action plan in this country and in, uh, elsewhere, right, the future trends in renewable energy and electrification demand are well known, and basically they're going to be increasing significantly. They have increased significantly, but they are set to continue that, that trend of increase. And certainly on the way to 2050, where we hope to be in a net zero carbon scenario, that will certainly be the case on, on a massive scale. So people often consider mostly the sources, the supply side, we need to connect more wind, the grid can often be forgotten. Now, if you ask any renewable energy developer, they are not forgetting it because oftentimes they are struggling to get a grid connection. Ireland, Britain, elsewhere around Europe, the, the grid congestion, the ability to get a quick, timely and sufficiently large grid connection for your renewable energy project is a key kind of pain point for renewable energy developers. Now, this study is not dealing with that. This is kind of a higher order study looking at what are the power corridors that Europe needs on a kind of almost a continental basis. So what does that high power transmission system look like? Um, and the goal was really to look at scenarios around that and what a pan-European system would look like and what a pan-European power flows might look like. And linked to that is the often told story, of course, around <clears throat> with enough geographical diversity of renewable energy, um, we can then the wind will belong somewhere across Europe. As we know well in Ireland, we don't we're not sufficiently large that we have enough diversity of wind resource to, for that to really be the case. But when you start to think of these things on a continental basis, which is what we're doing in this study, you can actually see that actually indeed <clears throat> with enough wind and solar, there's a great <clears throat> excuse me resource available. So that's kind of where we were looking to examine and really the structural nature and these kind of power flow characters, essentially a power exchange uh, between countries. In terms of, well, who operates the grids, as we will know well, I'm sure we have national TSOs, transmission system operators. So in each country, we have generally a single TSO that's operating their high voltage grids. And at a European level, we have an organization called ENSOE, the European Association for the Cooperation of Transmission System Operators for Electricity. Um, and their role is kind of a coordinating role. Historically, it's been very much and the role and function of system operators is still very much on a national basis, and we do have national grids along aligned with sovereign borders. As we will know well, of course, the physics, the flows of electricity have no regard for that, and this can be a key challenge. So two single events of, I think, of interest and relevance. One was the Italian blackout. I couldn't believe it was so long ago, and I went to look it up again, but September 2003. Um, and without getting into the detail of it, there's a lot of studies or reports online it arose basically because of mal-coordination between the Italian operator and I think the Swiss operator and the operators in neighboring systems. So this lack of coordinated operation and action in response to events on the grid led to a rather severe blackout back, back in Italy in 2003. Um, more recently in, in 2021, possibly even during the course of the study that we carried out, there was a similar enough event, or not quite similar, but you know, an event happened on the grid but well, what happened this time, I think the lessons had been learned from previous years and much greater coordination was achieved. And there was a system separation, if you can imagine the European grid separating east to west, but there was no loss of supply. So continuity of supply was maintained. I'm pointing to these things because the trend here is going to be the need for much greater coordination between national TSOs. And what we're seeing with the study and the scenarios we're looking at, which I'll present in just a minute, is that that coordination is going to grow ever more if we want to get to that decarbonized energy scenario. So, uh, and one of the key results I think that we reveal here is that the kind of business as usual approach um, is probably not going to be fit for purpose. The other kind of, let's say, major trend at the moment, I would say, is, of course, well, the increased uncertainty or stochasticity in the system, um, obviously arising from wind generation, other renewable sources, also on the demand side, we storage connection, connecting. We have a lot of things happening. A lot of uncertainty now is present in the system. So we've, as we know well, moved from a deterministic type system into a much more stochastic or uncertain system. The consequence of that is what we're seeing across Europe is markets are moving much closer to real time. So we still have day ahead markets, but there's an increasing move to kind of, you know, hour ahead balancing type markets, certainly in Britain and elsewhere. And, and they're coming about out of necessity because they're going to have a wind forecast error. We're going to have unexpected events happening. So we have this increased uncertainty. Actions are going to be need, it needed much closer to real time and the markets and market structures need, need to reflect that. So suffice to say, the role of TSOs and market operators is only getting more complex and more complicated. And again, this is here and now, if we think towards 2050, 2030, that's just gonna increase and increase. So 
What we did in this study was initially start with an existing, I guess, energy scenario and demand scenario that that super node and Marcus, I think, had a guiding hand in this developed previously as scenarios for what might the electricity demand look like in 2030, 2030 and indeed 2050 been of most relevance. Um, so we kind of examined that and just did a bit of almost validation and scrutiny of like, well, is that correct? And is that is that reasonable? Um, I think you can note particularly the increase in transport, if I can get the laser going, yeah, transport, transport. So almost very little in, in electricity transport at the moment and then a, a big increase towards 2050. Um, but notably, right, for all my principles around energy efficiency, a massive increase in electricity demand uh, from 2020 to 2050 is, is what's expected. And that's part of the decarbonization story, but it, as you can imagine immediately, almost a tripling uh, is going to lead to a big consequence for the, for the physical grid and infrastructure. So that's the demand side of the equation. On the generation side, we looked at, well, carbon-free sources, what does it look like? So there's going to be nuclear, in our opinion, across Europe, uh, hydro for sure, and other dispatchable up and down plants, largely biomass, a lot of storage. So storage had a big role to play in this future grid. Uh, and of course, then wind and solar, according to the available resource in each country, based on targets, but also based on resources. And we did a number of scenarios around that, which I'll, I'll get into in just a moment. So the key question that we're trying to address here is the structural composition of the future grid and how renewables can interact with storage. And I think particularly, I would say, the often ignored element of, of transmission and transmission capacity and how that will all potentially fit together and how it might interact under different scenarios. So we built a quite a simple electrical model so from an electrical engineering perspective, nothing particularly you know, complicated here, a, a DC power flow model uh, with a single node representation for each country. So all of Ireland's grid represented as a single node or bus bar. So, you know, obviously we're not going here for electrical ac accuracy. The key thing we're trying to address is what will the flows look along these power corridors between these each of the, the countries uh, across Europe and what the capacity of them might be, what should it be, and, and so on. Um, so quite an extensive model, um, but that's kind of, I guess, the indicative, and I think we've developed a graphical user interface, Marcus, if I'm not, not mistaken, right around this as well, uh, along the way. Um, so just again, to be very clear about the limitations of the model, we're just looking at the power flows and the associated capacities. There's no volts, there's no reactor power, there's none of those other interesting things from my perspective, um, but to build a model of this scale and size, it's just not tractable to, to do that. And it's also not particularly relevant, let's say, for the particular questions we were seeking to answer. We were looking at an optimization problem here. We were looking at minimizing the sum of the operational costs, so OPEX and the capital cost, CAPEX. And within those costs, what we're looking at, well, what's the capacity of the transmission line? So that was kind of a variable within our, our, our model. The storage capacity, curtailment costs, and also looking at load shedding. And I'll explain a little bit more on what exactly I mean by, by load shedding. It was kind of used as an equivalent, like basically we can't meet the demand. I'm not predicting that load shedding will occur on the scale outlined in the report here, uh, but it was there to serve a particular purpose. And we were looking at an hourly time resolution for a year, so for 2050, so 8,000, 8,760 hours. Doing a single optimization across all of those hours, looking at all of the whole model, all the demand, and looking at how do we meet the energy demand and how do we, how do the renewables, the storage, how does the storage operate in terms of charging, discharging, what level of curtainment was, was at play? And crucially then, what level of transmission capacity, the capacity of each of these power lines in terms of the ability or the amount of power that they can transfer um, might be available or indeed should be available in future years. So we looked at three scenarios, uh, business as usual, where we're just looking at resource allocation, very much the ongoing kind of national perspective. Uh, countries looking at their national resource, doing it in line with their own requirements. And some of some investment in transmission system, but when you start to look at this just in a national perspective, this pan-European interconnection is still present, is still invested in, but is not such a, a, a prominent feature, let's say, uh, of the scenario. Second, we looked at a, a pan-European scenario where we looked at a more European perspective, so European in scope, uh, considering the needs of the whole European system. And then, and so in terms of the, which is all detailed in the report, the amount of offshore wind, the amount of solar PV, the amount installed in various countries was in line with that. And of course, as you might expect, was much more ambitious. Um, 
We included in this some element of superconducting supernode technology. Uh, we still maintain some limitations on electricity flows, so it's not a full kind of all singing, all dancing superconducting grid by 2050, but acknowledging there may be some role for within that. And then the third scenario was kind of the unconstrained scenario, um, without the ideal scenario from a supernova perspective, perhaps. Uh, so superconducting, as you know, will effectively mean a, a zero resistance, a really high power capacity uh, corridor being uh, created. Uh, so basically removing transmission constraints. And we kind of assumed that transmission network, these corridors were superconducting enabled and, and looked at what that might look like. Before I get into, and I apologize almost for this, this graph immediately, <laughs> before I get into some of the more interesting results or intelligible results, just to highlight the level of detail that we did have. So this is showing the annual transmission line utilization. So for each of these lines, we're looking at, well, how much are they actually used? What was the level of rated power relative to its maximum opacity that, that was used over a given year? Top is business as usual. The middle is uh, our pan-European and the bottom is our unconstrained. And while they, at first look, they look kind of similar. When you do examine them a bit more closely, you can see significant enough actual increase in transmission utilization as we move from BAU to pan-European and indeed to that, that uh, superconducting unconstrained scenario. Um, and that's important in that it highlighted, if we build out more transmission, it will, in fact, be used. And the, as we saw when we looked at the overall costs, the investments that we saw in transmission technology replaced other costs within, within the overall problem, um, which I think was really one of the core things we were trying to examine was, well, if we did have a grid such as, as this, would it actually be used? Would there be power flows along these lines? And indeed, I think really importantly, in terms of, I guess, investment signals, these kinds of results can highlight and give a good signal as to well, what are the power flow corridors between countries that would be most useful and that would be most utilized. And the story behind it is, of course, you can imagine where the renewable resource is and getting to where the major demand centers are. So in terms of the, the cost components, so again, we're doing this eight, seven, 60 hours in a year, uh, or uh, looking at the whole the year. And these are the various cost elements that we considered. Um, so again, it's a combination of operation and capacity costs. So the operation or the capacity of investments in energy storage, the charging, discharging of energy storage, transmission costs, generation curtailment, operating costs, so power purchasing, and then then load shedding. Now on load shedding and as uh, the costs are very high because obviously when you're if you're looking at load shedding something has something has gone wrong basically. And um, what we were looking at it representing here was that well it looks what we're seeing in this case is that actually the transmission infrastructure is basically inadequate. Or you could look at it as, well, you're looking at a decarbonized scenario. Maybe you need something else there to avoid that, that load being shed. But we kind of said, no, we'll stick to what a decarbonized grid looks like because we think that's where we that's what the target is. That's what we need to get to. Um, so just allowing other technologies to be in there, you know, in an unrealistic level, we decided that wasn't, wasn't the way forward. So I wouldn't focus too much on the, the euro values of those load shedding costs, but just don't worry about the, the relative values. But the key bit here really is if you look at C3, the there, you can see a transmission cost. And we're seeing in each case a relatively higher increase in transmission investment costs based on the assumed cost of, of transmission technologies is really the key driver. And that utilization that I talked about and that this transmission assets would actually be used uh, is really what drives us to a lower overall cost. So to find some of some of these results and markers will build out some of these results in his presentation in just a moment. The key thing that this model really is, is about is, is this interplay between transmission, storage, and curtailment. Uh, and storage was a really uh, critical, I'd say, I would say, element in terms of what we were looking at. It was very clear that, yes, transmission, but absolutely storage was needed. Uh, and there's, there's probably more work that we could do in terms of the refinement of that modeling of that storage. Um, it, for us, it demonstrated quite clearly that the net benefit of a large investment in new transmission assets, and behind that is a new approach to planning the European grid, I think is, is the key message here that, that I would have delivered a net benefit, delivered a cost reduction. Um, and again, my little disclaimer, I would really focus on, on the relative cost rather than the euros. We're looking 2050, the costs are very much uncertain, but I think the relative cost, that utilization of those transmission lines is is an important result that, that can be carried forward. 
Um, and finally, then just on the business as usual, I mean, there was investment in transmission in, in that business as usual. So the model did you know, propose some investment. Um, but given that it was reflecting a national perspective, uh, you know, we just don't think that that's going to come to pass, but it's business as usual. So perhaps if it does represent a continuation of business as usual. So I think there is something of note within that. Just finally, on, on further work, uh, like, like any good academic, I'm always looking at, oh, we could do that better. We could improve the model. There's lots, right? And I think super notable, probably, and hopefully Marcus is going to outline a little bit of that in just a moment. So obviously, what we could certainly model, maybe instead of representing Germany as a single node, we could maybe look to break that out into a, 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 a scaled out model of what that grid is. Um, we didn't look at any contingency analysis or M minus one. We were just looking at, again, under normal operation, what do these bulk power flow corridors look like and what can they do? Um, as I've indicated, I think this model is really useful for identifying the best nodes to look to improve the performance of the system, i.e. for investment in transmission. And I think also if we did improve our storage technology, so we just had a single storage technology, we didn't develop a short, medium and long duration storage technology, three different models. As we'll know, long duration storage in particular is, is getting a lot of focus. Uh, at the moment, in that we do have short duration storage available already, um, that could certainly be uh, be refined. Um, and then also finally, just yet to mention the demand side, that that was not we didn't really allow that to play a role, um, but certainly it, it already is playing an important role in our system. Uh, uh, we, we can certainly imagine that it, it would also be in 2050. So that's an introduction to the model, and hopefully gives you a sense of what we we're trying to achieve and some of the results. I'll now hand to Marcus, who I think will pick up on some of the, the next work. Brilliant. Well, thank you very much for having me. Delighted to see everyone and everyone online. I'm delighted to see the interest in the work we've done with Andrew and uh, UCD. So what I'm going to be presenting is just a bit further on the analysis we conducted. So discussing some of the key findings and moving on to some of the questions we asked ourselves when we got the model from, from UCD. So just to begin, Don't seem to be able to change the slide. There we go. So just to describe very quickly who Supernode are and why we're interested in European power flows and in particular why we're interested in it for Ireland. So Supernode is a, a relatively young technology company. We're coming up to five years old this year actually, and it was founded by Eddie O'Connor, who you might know from past ventures with electricity and mainstream renewable power. On our board, then, we've got Pat Cox, who's a former president of the European Parliament. We do a huge amount of work on policy and regulation and looking at change within grid infrastructure and the energy transition as a whole. And finally, we've also got Chelling Roca and Hen Henrik O'Madsen, who come from Acker, who are part owners of, of Supernote. So they hold a 50% ownership. And John Fitzgerald is our CEO. So he's ex-director of grid development at uh, Airgrid. He was responsible for the East-West interconnector connecting Dublin to Liverpool. So our vision as a company when we started off really was looking at supplying people with secure, affordable and renewable energy. We fully believe in decarbonization by 2050. We fully believe that electrification and in particular direct electrification is a lever we need to push quite firmly and quite quickly. So what we're doing is looking to develop and market innovative transmission technologies based on superconductors. So Andrew gave a, a brief explanation on superconductivity already, but again, just to reiterate, it is a phenomenon that occurs with certain materials that when cooled below a critical temperature, they operate with zero electrical resistance. And what we show really is just a cross section of what a superconductor could look like. So this is what we're working on. These are cables that exist in the system today. They've been deployed uh, in MRIs uh, and for high power magnets in particular, but they also exist in the distribution system. So they unlock the capability of uh, power dense corridors in urban environments in particular. So what we're looking to do is leverage that experience and push it to much higher capacities and much longer distances. One of our firm belief is in the supergrid. We believe that when it comes to renewable decarbonization in particular, that we need a much larger grid. Andrew's mentioned the benefits already. We believe that with the tripling of electricity demand, we're going to need a significant amount of renewables, over 2,000 gigawatts on the grid alone. And these renewables are best found in particular on the peripheries of the continent. So we know very well here in Ireland that we've got a strong renewable wind resource, but that exists as well in the rest of the Northern Seas, in the North Sea and the Baltic Sea in particular. When it comes to solar, a lot of that is found, of course, in the southern states, but does exist in decent capacities as well outside of it. So connecting these two renewable resources together and facilitating the flows of power 
from these areas of, of resource is, is a strong and uh, enabling factor in decarbonization and will result in a secure grid in the longer term future. And there is, of course, this complementary relationship between wind and solar. The wind is, of course, stronger in the winter months when solar drops down and vice versa in the summer months. So the objectives for proof for us when we looked at uh, doing the work and, and reached out to UCD, we were really interested in this nodal power flows. So looking at when you look at country borders, what flows are required, uh, what flows could be enabled, and how big could these flows uh, get to, depending on the scenarios. We also wanted to understand when we consider these grid constraints, what happens to these power flows, what happens in the energy system, and the knock-on effect on what's already been mentioned on curtailment, storage, and load shedding. And then looking this further is looking at the effect that these scenarios have on the installed capacities for the three scenarios and the knock-on effect on the cost of energy served. And then finally, we're of course interested in what this means for Ireland. So if we can highlight the what a more interconnected Europe looks like, what that brings to Ireland and how we can actually take full advantage of it. So very quickly, just to run through the, the numbers that Andrew's already, already shown, what we found really is the key takeaway when, when we did this work was that small investments in transmission can result in pretty significant large savings in the overall system and most critically can result in a more effective and secure grid of the future. So I just wanted to highlight, um, again, relative cost, don't need to pay too much focus on the numbers themselves, but the percentages are quite interesting, showing that even a pan-European scenario, which sees a, a relatively minor increase in interconnection, can have a, a fairly significant effect on the cost of energy to the consumer in Europe for the future. So when we finished this modeling work, we thought we were done, but you're never really done with the model. Models can always do with improvements. You can also have questions on the model itself. So we sat down and, well, asked if we were to present this model, what types of questions could we be asked? And how can we use the model now to, to address them? So we undertook a, a number of, of sensitivity analyses to, to consider these different um, and questions. So one of the important ones was, as is always asked, what happens if the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining? So we wanted to look at different renewable resource years. So the year we modeled with UCD was based on 2019 weather data for Europe. We wanted to consider historically, what about an average resource year? What about a low resource year? What effect does that have on the model? And how does it affect the numbers of power flows at the end of it? We wanted to understand between the three scenarios, how much could Ireland export? So when we look at net import and export, what's the opportunity for Ireland? We are a relatively small nation with a relatively small demand. So how can we harness our renewable resource and how can we contribute to Europe decarbonizing? We wanted to look at the largest power flows. So when looking at these corridors, specifically looking at how the peripheries can play a role in importing power or exporting power, excuse me, to Central Europe, where the largest demand centers lie. So predominantly looking at Germany, France, and Italy. Finally, we wanted to consider copper cables and energy storage from a cost perspective. So we did look at copper cables. We wanted to forecast a little bit to the future and said, okay, well, if copper was cheaper, what knock-on effect does that have on the overall cost of the system? And likewise for energy storage. As Andrew mentioned already, we did just model energy storage as both short and long duration energy storage, but we wanted to take into account, okay, well, if an energy storage was to, to continue dropping in cost, what happens overall on the model itself? So I want to just cover first um, the power flows. So looking at some of the major corridors. So this was just some data taken from one of the hours in August. So this is based on the 2019 weather data. And it's quite interesting to highlight what's happening in Ireland in particular. So this comes from the unconstrained scenario. We wanted just to highlight how, how big some of these power flows could get. And you can see that Ireland is exporting 32 gigawatts of power to France. Now, France itself is an interesting node in Europe because it's a, of its geographic location. It acts as both a, a significant importer of power, using itself to meet its own demand, but also in linking it and bringing power to neighboring countries, in particular Germany and Italy. So we can see it's also importing 27 gigawatts from the UK. There's 80 gigawatts of power being exported from Spain to France, but there's also a significant amount of power being passed on to the neighboring countries. So the blue colors shown in the graphic here represent countries that are importing power and moving it on to neighboring countries. The other interesting power corridor is from the Nordics into Central Europe. So we know there is a huge hydro resource up in the Nordics. There's also a significant offshore wind resource in particular, and this is highlighted here in some of the power flows we're seeing. So we can see Norway is exporting a significant amount of power into Denmark, beyond what Denmark is, is looking for itself. But Denmark's acting as an intermediary node here and, and passing this power into Germany to, to feed that demand. 
So it's important to note in, in this scenario, in particular in unconstrained, this is where renewable resources dictated more where the actual capacity was installed. So the likes of Germany and Italy, for example, where the renewable resource isn't actually great relative to their demand. Uh, they're more dependent on neighboring countries to bring power and balance their, their system as a whole. So when looking at the different resource years, we wanted to highlight some of the years we considered. This is just modeling relative to 1990, which we saw as quite a, a high year, where the other years uh, really rate against it. So we considered four other years. We considered another high resource year, just to, to show. We considered a really low resource year in 2010, which was seen to be relatively poor uh, compared to the other years. And then another average year to compare against our 2019 data to, to validate the model itself. So these, these four years, at varying levels of wind and solar within them, the corresponding knock-on effect on the, the hourly supply as well. Uh, and we wanted to just consider what, what the outputs were. So what we found quite encouragingly uh, after doing all the significant modeling work was actually the results were quite consistent. We found that all the, the five years that we modeled resulted with the pan-European scenario to be in the mid 30% uh, level of cheap, cheaper to the relative to the business as usual approach. So really the key takeaway, and this is again, reinforcing that, that takeaway is that facilitating larger power flows, reduce the level of curtailment and load shedding, and also reduce the total installed operating capacity for Europe as a whole. When we looked at what role Ireland can play, we can see really the challenges with the business as usual and the repercussions for Ireland. It's pretty tough to see what we're exporting because we're exporting very little in the business as usual approach. And that's, again, looking at this nationalistic focus, it's looking at interconnection that's pretty much in line with European targets of 15%. So we're doing very little there. As we start unlocking transmission, and in particular in the unconstrained scenario, where we gain a much larger share of offshore wind, more in line with our current ambitions of uh, 30 plus gigawatts in, in Irish waters, we can see we're, we're going straight into the big leagues, into the top five or top six of the countries and with respect to, to exporting and looking at about 350 terawatt hours of, of export. For context, it's about 10 times our, our current electricity demands. So a fairly significant jump in, in power that, that we are capable of supplying to Europe. With regards to the importers, again, it's important to note in, in the unconstrained scenario, just how dependent some of the countries will be on its neighbors for, for supplying power. They already are to a certain extent, but this is further magnified as uh, the renewable capacity itself is located outside their borders. So France can be seen as one of the largest importers of, of power and really by far and away uh, one of the most critical nodes in terms of how interconnected Europe could be. <clears throat> Excuse me. So just highlighting a bit more on some of these corridors and we wanted to do a bit of analysis on what these nodes look like, what the line ratings could look like, and the cross-border gigawatt kilometer uh, units, what this looks like. So the German Dan Danish uh, line in particular was seen to be quite significant with the average flows just above 40 gigawatts. So fairly big compared to the level of interconnection, which is in and around that figure today in Europe as a whole. When we scroll down some of these lines, we can see on the pan EU basis anyway, that a lot of them are ticking off some of the major countries or the neighboring countries, with Italy and France being another significant one. Italy has a relatively poor resource beyond solar in the south, but a lot of its, its demand is, is located in the north, so they're dependent on France for renewable resources. Likewise, Germany is quite heavily interconnected with its neighboring countries. Switzerland is, is present there because of its hydro resource. It's, it's incredibly useful for, for assisting and balancing. Poland is quite significant as well. Uh, again, they've an, an offshore resource that's starting to grow in ambition as well. So the gigawatt kilometer figures just, just show us how significant the potential market for um, innovative transmission technologies, whether it be operating existing HVDC to potential limits with respect to voltage levels or superconductors and unlocking the, these corridors as a whole. So with respect to copper cable costs, it's quite difficult, and in particular when we did the study, to look at where copper prices are going. And pretty soon after the study was done, copper prices started going a bit mad. What we considered was what would occur with XLP copper cables if there was a 20% drop in cost. So the knock-on effect really what was found quite interesting was that there was a reduction in, in, in uh, the, the actual cost in all of the scenarios in particular. Um, and we wanted to compare that to if we were looking at superconducting technology and the, that joint scenario with it. 
So there's actually a complementary relationship there where we found superconductors were incredibly useful in particular in the offshore environment, but, but copper was still dominant with respect to cost on the onshore environment. If we were to redo this again, I think we'd be looking at a scenario where copper continues increasing. A lot of the forecasts now today are looking at uh, copper demand increasing quite significantly and supply not being capable of meeting that. Um, so this is a question we'd love to go back to and assume, well, if copper costs were to increase would the knock-on effect on the cable cost be 20, 30, 40, or even 50%, and what that effect has on the model as a whole. With respect to energy storage, we were much more ambitious on what could happen. We've seen the rapid decline in the cost of energy storage, and in particular, battery storage most recently. It's had an incredible fall, in particular in the price of lithium ion batteries. And of course, they serve a purpose more in the short-term energy duration. Uh, we also just considered for the long-term an average price on the, the cost of, of storage per megawatt hour. So we assumed then in this uh, sensitivity analysis, a 50% drop in the cost of energy storage. What was found, of course, is it had a, a significant effect in particular in the, the business as usual approach. The, the fact that energy storage became much cheaper, it became a more viable option to increase the level of energy storage on the system and had a knock-on effect then on the cost of energy served. Likewise for the pan-European scenario. So while transmission still maintained a high fare in, in that scenario, storage played a, a bigger role again. So transmission was able to facilitate these power flows and keep storage topped up, but also bring that energy that was stored to uh, locations when, when it's needed. So again, just highlighting that we did not distinguish between the energy storage types, and this is something we'd, we'd like to take further on uh, to consider the different technologies, to consider usable lives of the technologies um, and the operational cycles of, in particular, battery storage itself. The final question we asked ourselves is on pan-European target levels. So in our baseline scenario for pan-EU, we sought a 20% increase in interconnection relative to the business as usual. We wanted to up this and see what happens if you up that to 40%. So not going to the unconstrained level, but increasing that level of interconnection again. What we found in the pan-European scenario, quite interestingly, was that there was a drop of 15% or 14%, excuse me, in transmission utilization and a, a, a reduction in the cost of energy served by, by 28%. So again, really reinforcing that point that increasing interconnection has a significant effect on the cost of the consumer, the cost of energy served, and on the secure and uh, reliable operation of the system uh, as a whole for Europe. So conclusions are what we took away from, from this model here, here at Supernode. Well, we found the business as usual approach probably isn't going to work. It's going to be more costly. It's going to be less reliable. It's going to be more challenging. and when we're looking at decarbonization and climate change knows no borders, it's not going to get us there. Bottlenecks in transmission in particular mean system balancing becomes more challenging. Getting the level of renewables we want to get onto the system becomes more challenging. And really the approach we're taking right now is, is just fundamentally flawed. We need to consider a, a different approach to how we develop grid as a whole. Um, and that's what's starting to happen at a European level with uh, regional development of, of, of transmission. <clears throat> We feel that Europe, and not just Europe, but, but globally, the, the approach to transmission needs to change. We need to highlight its importance. A lot of the focus is on renewables targets, which is absolutely necessary, but that needs to go hand in hand with how that integrates into our energy system. We can't keep setting more and more ambitious targets if we don't have a plan on how we connect them into the grid. So this is where, for Europe in particular, considering how it's established, it needs a coordinated approach. We know that certain areas have better resource than others. We need to work together to ensure that the best resources are harnessed and that this power can move from these areas of high resource to areas of high demand as easily as possible. So these small investments in infrastructure can be really reduced even further if they're coordinated. Otherwise, we will end up with a system with duplicated lines with relatively poor interconnection and struggling to keep the lights on. So finally, looking at the, the questions that we asked at the start, just as a brief summary. So what if the wind isn't blowing or the sun isn't shining? Well, we found with modeling the five years and the five different renewable resource years that we found consistent results. It doesn't matter whether it's a high resource year or a low resource year, there is absolutely benefits to interconnecting Europe even further. How much could Ireland export? Well, this was, I guess, in the scheme, grand scheme of things now, maybe relatively unambitious for where Ireland's at now, but with 350 terawatt hours regardless. 
With the recent ORADP2, that target could actually be higher. With the level of installed capacity potential in Ireland, we could see that 350 terawatt hours increase if our ambitions on renewables is matched by ambition with how we uh, develop a, a route to market and interconnect with the rest of Europe. With respect to the largest power flows seen in Europe, we've seen that in an unconstrained scenario, these could be huge multi-gigawatt transmission corridors necessary to balance the system. This is something that is coming down the line. This is something that is being planned by certain countries in, in Europe, but not all. And this is something that won't work unless we are all planning this together in a coordinated approach. Otherwise, we will have systems planning on a nationalistic basis, others looking to interconnect, and there will be challenges in how the energy system is run in the future. We covered the, the cost of copper cables becoming cheaper. We saw that while the, the associated transmission costs dropped, it had a, a more significant effect on, on how much transmission was, was deployed and the knock-on effect on transmission utilization. So these high capacity corridors became slightly higher, but more than anything, the utilization costs dropped, or excuse me, increased as uh, these lines were used more, more heavily to balance the system as a whole. With respect to energy storage, it's an incredibly important piece of the puzzle. Energy storage is vital in, in how we uh, move towards decarbonization and how it plays that role with transmission in being able to locate um, storage more strategically and being able to connect it up so it's not just used at a local level, that it can be deployed at a, a larger scale and, and this power moved around more easily. And then finally, just on the, the pan-European changing these interconnection targets. Again, following the trend of, of, of the presentation as a whole, really, uh, the, the key takeaway is interconnection is a net benefit to the system. While there is upfront costs in developing this interconnection and there will be challenges in developing this interconnection and transmission system, the overall benefit to the consumer is huge. It does facilitate a more secure and reliable system and will facilitate us getting to a decarbonized Europe by 2050. So that's me. Thank you very much.